Good morning. You know, and if there was or is a word for today, I was just thinking, you know what it is? It's word. Amen? Word as in God's word. Word as in spoken word. You know, thank you, Debbie. What an amazing testimony. God is still in the miracle working business. You know, for those people who think maybe not or they got another idea, I just say, well, has the job description changed? Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when we speak that word, the atmosphere has to align with the God who created all that is. Amen. And wow, just think that we are ambassadors. We have been charged and given that word to spread. Pretty cool, right? Well, I'm going to speed along here. I, I've got some uh, very practical, great stuff to uh, share with everyone today. Uh, great time for it, right? As we prepare for the holiday uh, that rounds out the year and looking towards a whole new set of days, a whole new set of opportunities, a whole new uh, set of life challenges, right? Challenges come along with everything else. Challenges are common to this life. Really where I want to start, I'm going to kind of fast forward through some of my notes here, but just get to the part where we recognize that we have victory in Jesus. You know, we hear that maybe uh, a little too much, maybe, or at least a little bit more than we realize. You know, what does it mean to have victory in Jesus? And first of all, for the folks online, welcome. Uh, I just want to include everyone because this word is for everyone. We just went through Christmas, and, they, you know, the angels heralded glad tidings of great joy to all people. And so whether this is the first time hearing about Jesus, uh, having him extend a hand to you, or whether it's the 42nd year of ministry, you know, salvation is a door, a door, an open door that we walk through. But we walk through it and beyond it. Amen. And so as we do that, we recognize more and more every day with each step we take the victory that is ours in Christ. In Christ. I want to look at a couple verses, or a couple passages rather, as we kind of get going, kind of lay the groundwork for this. Um, in Romans 6, 11, you can turn there if you like. Romans 6, 11 through 14, I want to kind of demonstrate some ways that we are victorious, are present. Uh, the fight has been won by Jesus, and we are walking out recognizing what that means, the depth of it. It is truth for all of us to accept what Paul says in Romans 6. He says, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin. Reckon, count. Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Do not let, let being the operative word, sin reign in your mortal body. We have an option. We have a choice because of what Jesus did. But it is a choice. Will we let that futility that is common to our flesh reign? Or will we live in the strength that is ours in Christ? He says, do not present your members as instruments of righteousness, instruments to righteousness, as, as, as in, think of a wind instrument. Don't present yourself. Don't let those things put their, push their air through you. But rather, as an instrument of God, alive from the dead. We are free. That victory is ours in terms of being free from sin. We are also new creations in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, a well-known passage, 5.17, of course, declares that we are new creations, that old things have passed away and all things have become new. And again, we're just laying a groundwork here, but uh, no, you don't have to raise your hand, but who feels new and fresh every day? Right? I mentioned challenges a moment ago. We, we think about the new year. Man, sometimes it's a challenge just to get out of bed. 
whether it's our body and or our mind and or just stuff on our plate. But we are a new creation. So today is all about how we recognize that. It's nice to, to see it, to read it. It's even better to believe it. But James tells us that faith without works, belief that is not demonstrated in works, is dead. It's useless. It's lifeless. How tragic is it to be a winner and yet act and feel like a loser? Hmm. And so it is for these reasons that we must practice Practice Christ. Practice being dead to sin. Practice re not responding to those old ways of feeling and thinking and being. Practice not to feel the way we used to feel when we were in that particular situation. Around those kind of people. We have to practice Christ. Salvation is a door. All of our sins are forgiven. And yet day to day, do we feel perfect? I'm not perfect. I don't even have to tell you that. But my sins are forgiven, and before God, I am in Christ. So as I go from day to day, I learn more and more about what's already been done. 2020 is a new year. Today's message is entitled, See Clearly in 2020. 2020. Oh, that we would all begin to see more clearly who we are, what we have in Christ, and not just for our lives. But for our neighbors, our friends, and our family, you know, you know, Christmas time, holidays are a time we spend with family and friends, and maybe it's a time then that we're aware of imperfections in ourselves and others. This world needs us healthy. This world needs us living, thinking, acting, believing like Jesus. Oh, that we would see clearly in 2020. Well, if that's the foundation, I guess it has been laid for where we are going now because each day is a choice. And actually, each day is actually made up of many choices. Will we, when confronted with life, Confronted with challenges, confronted with the same old, which road will we take? Choice. You know, before we came to Christ, we didn't even have a choice. We didn't even know there was a choice. That's what being darkened means in our mind. We just are slaves to what we feel. We have a choice. Will we choose the path of life? Or will we go back to what is comfortable, what is only all too natural? But we have to recognize that as we choose the high road, the God road, the Jesus road, our feelings aren't necessarily going to follow. Our mind might and probably won't always agree People we know may not get it. So what do we do? Well, that brings us back to the Word. The unchanging, world-creating power of God. He changeth not, and His Word will never pass away. I want to introduce you to a couple words thinking these are probably new, at least to many of us, they were to me. First one is stell, 
S-T-E-L-E, stele. A stele, well, there's one right there. A gravestone could be considered a stele, but kind of in a more broad, general sense, a stele is most often stone, a tall, maybe taller than a, a standard kind of gravestone, but they are placed around uh, the countryside, embedded in soil, and they are inscribed. They, in this case, could be inscribed with words, but also with images. The words set in stone find good application in a stele. Well, why do I bring that up? Because, this is a rather interesting, I wanted to introduce, introduce you to another word, miktam, miktam. It's a Hebrew word, miktam. Well, a miktam is a stel, okay? In Old Testament times, somewhat and beyond that, I guess, in, in New Testament, in the Greek world, we saw stels. Um, but what we find is stels in the book of Psalms. There's actually six miktam psalms, six of them. Now, you'll... Maybe know that uh, Psalms were the Psalter, the, the book of Psalms was like the songbook for the Jews way back when. And some of those Psalms were, were songs they sang every week. Some of those songs were, they call songs of ascent when they returned to Jerusalem. And they, each one had a great significance. Well, there's only six Miktam Psalms. And a Miktam, like I said, is a stel. There's three parts, and this is just kind of the way I would break it down. They don't always fall in a particular order, but there are three basic pieces, kind of essential pieces to the stel or miktam. Um, the first is challenge. Challenge. Now, if you've spent any time reading Psalms, you'll know that while they are songs, there's some sadness, there's some hurt, there's some ugliness, even bloodshed in the Psalms. A lot of them are written by David, a man after God's own heart. He was a passionate, emotional human being. We hear and feel that in the Psalms. Well, these miktams are all written by David, and they are all songs. In fact, it's kind of interesting. They, each one of them, by the way, I'll, I'll just list them for you. We're going to look at Psalms 16 today, but there are six, as I said. The, the other five are 56, 57, 58, 59, and 60. And you will find with all of those other than 16 that they all say, and you know, some of this is handled differently in different translations, but most translations will say a miktam or a miktam of David, a stel, uh, an engraved statement. Okay, and we'll get into the significance of that in a moment. But those other five have to do with specific instances. They're historical, okay? It's almost like a, like a marker on a battlefield that says this is what occurred here on this and this date, okay? And these other Miktam Psalms talk about when David was hunted down by Saul. There's a couple of them that actually talk about when Saul sent men to kill David. There's one that David wrote when he was in the cave, you might remember, and Saul came into the cave and he made a choice, he, David, made a choice not to take Saul's life at that time. Well, he wrote these songs about that. Very interesting. Songs. You know what? There's some significant things about songs, right? You, you can get a song on your, on your tongue, right? On your brain. And it just plays over and over again. You know, people who memorize vast tracts of scripture say that they put it to song or to a tune. It helps us get things into our brain. And I think it's interesting that thousands of years ago, people were just the same as they are today. Song. Such that these truth sayings, these mental stells, would begin to engrave on the tablets of our minds God's truth. Hmm? So that when we are faced with a choice different options, two different tracks in life. We choose the path of life, but just like salvation, that's just a door. It's an it's a opportunity. You've got to step beyond that door, which means you've got to own your faith, right? It's one thing to say, have faith, or 
oh, I'm this, and I'm that. And But again, do we look to our feelings to establish that? We don't always feel it. In fact, even as, as believers, and we're going to see this here in just a moment, sometimes even the, the emotion, the, the move to pray, the move to live out our life can even get us off track if we are responding to human things, responding to brokenness in the world. The Spirit of God lives in us. If His Word is written on our minds, we think, we act, we march according to that truth. We don't move. It's set in stone. Turn to Psalm 16, if you will. This is where we will spend the rest of our time this morning. As you are turning there, I want to share something from Ephesians. Ephesians 5, 15 to 17. Don't bother turning there. Stay in Psalms. Paul says, See then, see then, that you walk circumspectly, looking around, heads up, ready for anything. Not as fools, but as wise. Well, what does he mean? Well, he goes on to tell us. Wise means, heads up, living means redeeming the time. Making every moment count. Why? Because these days are evil. It was true then, and man, it is true now. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Just a few verses down, it says... Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. You know, he's not trying to give us a new commandment here. It's, we should not be drunk with wine, but he's comparing two things. He says, don't be overcome with strong drink. Don't give something control over who you are. But in the way that you would seek that out for solace or enjoy that or be enraptured by that in the same way that you would as new people be saturated with the Holy Spirit. Guzzle the Holy Spirit. Drink in the Holy Spirit constantly. That's what he's saying. And, and interesting, uh, especially to our discussion this morning, is what follows be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another, as in this is a demonstration of what that means. Speaking to one another in what? Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, we don't do that. I mean, like if we were on Broadway, maybe, be, right? I'm going to sing to Peter, right? We're going to sing, oh, Callie. Oh. Well, I, I do that. Behind closed doors. But the point is, what do we make of that? I'm going to say this morning, one awesome, perfect, fitting, practical example is we declare God's truth to one another. As we are gifted, maybe we will do it in song. Right? We're going to declare the truth of the Lord. Gabby is healed in Jesus' name. I am healed. I walk in health by his stripes. I have been healed. You know, we celebrate communion daily with God. Communion, closeness, intimacy. And once a month, we celebrate it with a cup and a piece of bread. What does that symbolize? His body for ours. His flesh his emotions, right? His tendencies, his instincts. The new Adam, the perfect, renewed Adam. His for ours. We got to live that. It's one thing to know it. It's another to live it. And what about the blood? 
Bible tells us that the life is in the blood. That means after I've had a long day with four boys, so happy I don't have to rely on my life, my energy. It's kind of why Paul says, when I am weak, then I am strong. Because why? Well, when I'm physically strong, I, I don't feel a need to reach out and, and just rely, cling to God's strength. But when we're down and out, and that's how we feel, man, we cling to him and he comes through for us. Amen? All right. Psalm 16. I want to talk about these three pieces. And, and in Psalm 16, I, I got to back up a second to say, while those other miktams are specific to situations, Psalm 16 is kind of an all-purpose miktam, okay? One size fits all, general miktam. If you want one to keep in your pocket, always have ready. Here it is, Psalm 16. And those three parts appear in Psalm 16, of course, but they also, they, they're kind of in order. And so we're just going to take it verse by verse uh, and step by step. So the first one... Uh, well, you see there in verse 1, or it's kind of implied. And I would call this the challenge. This is that opportunity to go left or go right. We're faced with stuff. Stuff. Could be pains, physical pains. Could be emotional pains. Could be job issues, co-worker issues. Right. I think we all know about challenges and issues. Each of those are challenges, opportunities to go right or go left, to choose God's way or our way. We're going to sort this out using popular psychology. We're going to sort it out using some, some kind of methodology we've learned. It might work sometimes. But God's word not only carries us forward and, and works it out, it actually is way more powerful than that because life itself, circumstances have to align with God's word. He wants us just to march. The steps will come together. The road will align whether we see it or not. It has to. Verse 1 says, Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. This is one of those prayers, right? God, help me. I don't know what's going on here. Right? And I think it says something that in that moment, the, the first reaction is reaching out for God. It kind of says where we are. It says where we've come from, right? We're not just in the world. We're not estranged from God anymore. Right? We look to him. We pray those prayers, and he, I just want to continue here. Verse 2, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Father, I've, I've staked my claim in you. I've given up this. I've given up that. The only reason I'm in this job is because I asked you what you wanted, and you opened this door, and you led me this way. The only reason I'm in this relationship is the same. Whatever it is, it's like, it's like those disciples in the boat. Know ye not where we perish? He knows. He knows. When life gets stormy, he knows and he's right there. And so this is, I would say, natural. It's natural, common to this life to have these challenges, these moments. Romans tells us this world, ourselves, everything common to it, has been subjected to a futility. And so we are aware of that, and, and we have been, been enlightened. We, we are aware of this happening. We have a higher sense. We look at life now from a new perspective, a God perspective. We don't just experience it. We don't just say, oh, well, it's just normal to suffer. This is just as good as it gets. We know there's something better. Verse 3, as for the saints of the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Now, there's, there's a couple more verses. This goes up to verse 4. 
But I'm just taking these just so we can kind of encapsulate this, this first step, which is the challenge. This is the thing that takes us to that opportunity of choice. But the saints of the land are, are those that I take joy in. You know, this says a lot about the people we hang out with. You know, you're, you're with people sometimes that are uppers, and then there's people that are downers. There are people that are all over the placers. Right? You, you get the idea. And so he's, I think that's important because that's what he's talking about here. But it's a statement. Right? These people are who I see myself with. These are the people I belong with. These are the people I share things in common with. Now, we each of us have less than awesome traits. And so it's to say, I don't identify my being with that anymore. So I'm not going to be with that crowd. I've chosen to be a new person. The person God created me to be, and I'm going to identify with those same people. And then verse 4 continues with kind of the opposite here of, three, of 2 and 3. It says, The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. We can see a lot of that happening, can't we? Every, every cure they reach out for, every fix they try to implement, creates, maybe it helps a little bit, but it creates 10 more problems. We got to live in it. The sorrows of those who run after other gods shall multiply their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names even on my lips. What does that mean? What are the gods of this world? Money, power, fame, indulgence, security, right? Saying, I'm not going to pour out blood. Blood is a, a, a valuable sacrifice. That's kind of what it's talking about here. I'm not going to acknowledge them like that's something to do, something I should do. I'm not going to take what's valuable and give it away to a false god. I'm not going to hedge my bets. Well, I'm going to pray, but at the same time, you know, I'm going to, you know, you got to, God helps those who help themselves, you know. No, God helps those who can't help themselves. And we, as we become more like Jesus, do the same. So, in verses 1 through 4, you have section 1. Step 1. It's the challenge. You're confronted with stuff. Well, that brings us to, as I said, that point of decision. Verse 5. And verse 5 in itself is the second step. The second element of this miktam. It's the faith choice. The faith choice. Faith is belief evidenced by actions. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. You flick the switch. You've chosen that track. Okay, God, it's just you and me. I may have been in this situation before. It may feel common to me. It may feel even just kind of like my thing. This is how I... God, silence my lips. Write on my heart your words of truth that I may live them. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. It's you. I'm burning the bridge behind me. It's you. It's you and me in 2020. Every step along the way. I'm not going to be the same. I'm not going to look back. I don't care if, if it's a relationship that I remember from before. This time it's different. You are my portion in my cup. We heard that. Thank you, Debbie, so much for sharing that testimony. We, we heard that in her words. You know, her, her healing 
You know, healing is a supernatural thing. That God would sovereignly act and breathe life into our mortal bodies through the spirit of God that lives within us. It's a sovereign, supernatural act. And there's something of a transition between the spiritual and the natural. Our salvation is complete. We are perfect before God in the spirit. We live according to that reality. And when our flesh, our memory, our eyes, whatever it is, try to remind us, tries to say, no, I know who you are. You know how you are. Right? We say no. We say no. And when we do that, if we do that with the word of God, we take that sword of the spirit and we strike down those falsehoods. Step two is the faith choice. The belief evidenced with action. Well, step three is where the rubber hits the road. Where we live. And where we'll spend the last little bit here. Because step three is the, I call it, actionable truth. Where we got to live it out. Verse 6 says, The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Now, you just, just picture this. The lines, well, first of all, is that clear enough? The lines have fallen. What this means is my life as it is today, my finances as they are today, my job, my career set up, my relationship. If our lives are in God's hands, where we are today is where he has us. Doesn't matter what man may say. Doesn't matter how I may feel. The lines, I declare God's word. We declare it. It's written in stone. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a beautiful inheritance. Verse 7, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. You ever had a moment where you're, you're praying, where you're, you're pouring your heart out to God, and maybe you just, you're like, hello, God? I, I feel moments like that. Of course, it's important to remember who moved. There are moments where he seems quiet, but we declare the truth. What is the truth? I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. I'm already thanking him for that because I know it's true. In the night also, my... What word comes next in your Bible? In verse 7. In the night also, my what? Instructs me. Heart. Kind of interesting, one of these little factoids. The actual... And I don't know why this is. I, I, get, I think it's... It's unfortunate. Um, the word there is not heart. It's a different, the Hebrew word there is not the same. A couple verses later, we do see heart. The word there is kidney. Kidneys. Strange, right? Maybe. You do a little searching on kidneys. Now, let me make this simple. The Hebrews attributed to the heart what we commonly attribute to the head. Okay? This is the center of my being. You know, we think of this here. And they attributed to the kidneys what we typically associate with our heart, my guts. My gut tells me that's kidney. So let's read it again. In the night, my guts instruct me what? Look at the punctuation there. He's talking about the phrase that came first. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My gut tells me. Let's look at the opposite of that. I feel that's important. You ever experienced emotional trauma or pain or anxiety so great that it almost doubles you over? 
ever had those moments of just agony or despair? Complete lostness. I don't know how I'm going to pay the rent. It could be that. It could be over a child that's estranged, that's run away, that's run off the tracks. It could be a relationship is, is a big, is a common one, I think. I don't know if there's anything else that can cut us as deep because there's nothing else that bonds as deep. We know from the Psalms that David frequently felt like that. And so maybe in this moment, that's how he feels. Maybe that's how we feel when we pull out this stell. We declare it boldly to our situation. My kidneys are not doubling me over in pain. This is not who I am because God himself gives me counsel. My kidneys instruct me. Continuing, verse 8, I have set the Lord always before me, and because he's at my right hand, I will not be shaken. That's a great one, right? I will not, I will not be shaken. I have put the Lord always before me. Here's the reason, you know, it's easy to get religious about things, right? About going to church, about who we hang out with, about reading the Bible and praying, how often do you do this, and is it a discipline, and all these other things. Well, here's just a really good practical reason for all of that. I have set the Lord always before me. You know, my mom was always so good at, at our home growing up, putting verses everywhere around the home. Posters, verses, even notes in our lunch. Affirmations is a word. I have put the, you know, that's something we can just do. Just do. That will have an automatic reaction. And then verse 9, therefore my heart, and this is heart, is glad and my whole being rejoices and my flesh dwells secure. Well, what we hear is in that therefore. Because we live according to God's truth, it says that our heart is glad, my mind is at ease, I am rested, and my whole being. How often that, can that be said of us? The reality of this is, we're all in this together, and, but, but the reality, what we're being called to is, this place where we understand and inhabit the reality that our flesh dwells secure. It rejoices. Well, the verses that follow kind of support this truth. Verse 10, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. Sheol has to do with a chasm. It's like the, the center of the earth. It's like hell in a sense. Either way, you're not going to let me go to that place that threatens. Whatever it is. If this situation isn't immediately rectified, if I don't do this, if I don't answer this anxiety, I feel that this is going to happen. Or because logic tells me such and such. He's saying, no, you will not. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You know, as we conclude today, I... I just got to emphasize these, while these truths are powerful and life-changing, world-changing for each of us, they find their greatest power in application for others. 
You know, in Galatians, a book that talks a lot about, yes, this new faith, but how humans try to help this faith along in a bad way, in a flesh-honoring way. He says, you know what? None of that stuff amounts to a hill of beans. He says, you know what matters? Faith working through love. To supercharge our faith is to take the focus of the needs and in, just to sink them in the love God has, not only for us, but for others. Faith works through love. Heal me, strengthen me, yes, for me, but so that I can go and be like Jesus more. Free me from this anxiety, this heaviness, so that I can do the same for someone else. Turn this situation around, yes, because I need it, but because I want to take the instructions, the map, and give it to someone else. That's supercharging our faith. Well, we're going to transition. Uh, band, would you come? We're going to see a perfect example of this, walking it out in the waters of baptism. So as they come, let's seal away God's word in prayer. Father, Lord of all, we thank you for your enduring word. We thank you for your love that changes us. Father, I ask that you would seal away your word in each of our hearts. Write it on the tablets of our minds. Bring it to our minds through your Holy Spirit when we need it most. Give us your awareness. Let us feel what you feel when we look around us and see brokenness. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. Out of the way.